everyone. Uh, thanks for joining uh, our live virtual event with uh, Sharma Shields and uh, Steve Olson uh, for their books, uh, The Cassandra and The Apocalypse Factory. Uh, we are recording this event and it will be uh, viewable on this same web page after the event concludes. You can register in the same way at any point and watch the replay of that video if you have to leave early or if you have friends who want to watch it later on, let them know about that. Um, we are uh, really pleased here at Madison Books, where I, James Crossley, am the manager, to be working in partnership with uh, our good friends at Paulina Springs Books in Sisters, Oregon, and Country Bookshelf in Bozeman, Montana. Um, before we get to uh, letting our authors uh, have their conversation, uh, I want to point out a few things about the space we're in. Uh, first, and perhaps most importantly, there's a buy button at the bottom of the screen. Um, uh, please make use of it early and often, like uh, voters in Chicago used to do. Uh, you will be supporting these authors and the stores that bring them to you, and we will be very grateful. Uh, if you have any questions for either of these authors, or for me, goodness knows why, but if you did, uh, there is a, a button at the bottom of your screen marked Ask a Question that you can click on at any point. Uh, you can see the questions that others have asked and vote them up if you would like to hear those answered more than others. And uh, you can also leave comments in the chat window and at the side. And of course, uh, we do require, I was about to say request, but in fact, we require that you remain respectful in the chat. Um, we will be monitoring that and, and rude remarks will be uh, ejected along with their uh, remarkers. Uh, if you have any technical issues along the way, as we watch here, we recommend simply refreshing the browser. You will be put back in the stream where you were when you left off. Uh, you won't have to sign back in or anything like that. Um, and uh, we do recommend using the Chrome browser. That seems to work best with Crowdcast. Um, I think that about covers everything. Um, so uh, what I should do now is just introduce uh, the good people who are here with us tonight. Uh, Sharma Shields, first of all, uh, is a native of Spokane, Washington, and the author of the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association uh, award-winning novel, The Sasquatch Hunter's Almanac. Uh, her short stories and essays have appeared in the New York Times, Electric Lit, Catapult, Slate, Fairy Tale Review, and, and other outlets. She also runs a small press, Scablands Books, and uh, has worked at multiple independent bookstores and libraries across Washington State. Her most recent novel uh, is The Cassandra, uh, which tells the story of an unusual young woman, gifted and cursed with the ability to see the future, who runs away from home to become a secretary at the Hanford Nuclear uh, Reservation uh, in the early 1940s. Also with us is Steve Olson, uh, another native of Washington State, now resident in Seattle, who has written for the Atlantic Monthly, the Smithsonian, and many other magazines. He's a National Book Award nominee for Mapping Human History, Genes, Race, and Our Common Origins, and a Washington State Book Award winner for Eruption, the untold story of Mount St. Helens. His most recent book is The Apocalypse Factory, uh, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age, a new history of the nuclear era told from the perspective of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Um, I'm gonna let these two take it away and I'll come back in later to share your questions and my questions with our authors. But in the meanwhile, uh, take it away Sharma and Steve. Great, good to see you, Sharma. I know you're going first. Hi, yeah. Um, I just wanna say thank you, Steve, for involving me with the event, and thank you to the organizers and the bookstores, um, to James, I'm, I'm grateful for the introduction, thank you for that. Um, and I think I'm starting out reading. Is that uh, what we're doing? Should I get going? Sounds good to me. Okay. So I, uh, well, first off, I just want to start out by saying uh, and acknowledging that we are on where I am, uh, the traditional lands of the Spokane tribe. Um, and I am going to be reading to you from uh, the Cassandra, just the very beginning of it, and then one of the vision scenes as well. One of the first visions that Mildred has when she's first at Hanford. Um, so this begins in 1944, and I will just start out reading the first couple of pages of the book. This is from a chapter called To Make Men Free. I was at the mercy of the man behind the desk. I needed him to see my future as clearly as I saw it. He held four pink digits aloft, ring finger belted by a fat gold band, and listed off the qualities of the ideal working woman. Chaste. Willing, 
smart, silent. I swallowed his words, coaxed them into my bloodstream, my bones. I crossed my ankles and pinned my knees together, morphing into the exemplary she. The man eyed me with prideful ownership. Frankly, Miss Groves, you're the finest typist we've interviewed. Your speed and efficiency are commendable. I opened up my shoulders, smiling. They named me star pupil at OMAC secretarial. You're not a bad looking girl, you know that? Thank you, how kind of you. A little large, plumper than some, but a nice enough face. The man smoothed open the file on his desk. Good husband stock at Hanford, Miss Groves. Plenty of men to choose from. In my lap, my hands shook like tender newborn mice. Such sweet, dumb hands. Calm down, you wild darlings. I focused on the man's sunburnt face. It reminded me of a worm's face, sleek, thin-lipped, blunt. He was handsome in a wormish way, or wormish in a handsome way. If I squinted just a little, his head melted into a pink oval smudge. We spoke in a simple recruiting office in my hometown of Omak, Washington. All of Okanagan County was abuzz with the news of job openings at Hanford. It was like this too when they started construction at Grand Coulee Dam. We were patriots. We wanted to throw ourselves into the enterprise. Men and women help us win. Work at Hanford now, the Omak Okanagan Chronicle urged. I'd snipped out the newspaper article and folded it into my pocketbook away from mother's prying eyes. I was here in secret and the secrecy delighted me. Goose pimples bubbled up on my forearms and I tapped my fingers across them, tickled by how they transformed my girl flesh into snakeskin. The room we sat in was crisp and clean, beige paneled walls, pine floors, plain blue drapes. A war poster hanging behind the recruiter's worm head featured a young, attractive woman in uniform, crimson lips, chin nobly lifted, blue eyes snapping and firm, their color enhanced by the stars and stripes rippling behind her. Her proud expression spoke to me. I'm here, Mildred. I can help you. I smiled at her. I'm here too for you, for all of us. Aren't we lucky, her eyes said. If anyone can save them, it's you. Above her strong profile, it read, to make men free, enlist in the waves today. You will share the gratitude of a nation when victory is ours. So um, Mildred, as you can tell from the beginning of the book and her narr narration is a, is a little bit off. Something is somewhat strange with her. Um, and, and one of the things that's strange is that she does have the ability to see the future. Uh, she's clairvoyant, much like uh, Cassandra in the Cassandra myth from Greek mythology. Um, so she goes to uh, Hanford, she does get a job there. She begins working as a secretary. Um, and one of her earliest visions occurs along the banks of the Columbia River. Um, so I will read that scene now. Um, and one of the things I loved reading The Apocalypse Factory, which hopefully some of you are clicking the button and buying right now, um, is this really beautiful piece that um, reminds me of the piece that The New Yorker published all of those years ago um, by John Hershey about Hiroshima. And uh, there's a beautiful part where he follows one character, um, one man, journalistically, through his day after the bomb drops on Nagasaki. And I really thought that chapter was just so beautifully done, Steve. Um, so this kind of speaks to some of that devastation that's seen. Um, so I'm gonna read uh, that now. Later, an hour, several hours, the vision prodded me awake and urged me to rise. The same swampy, heady sensation fell over me, the one I always had during a vision the sound of invisible wings in my ears. The weight of it took hold of me by the armpits and pulled me outdoors. I floated obediently east through the dimmest shadows of the sleeping barracks. I traveled the short distance to the western bank of the Columbia River where the water whirled along the northeastern corner of the Hanford camp. Over the river and through the woods, but there were no woods here and my consciousness blinked in and out. 
I stumbled forward lazily, drunkenly. The wings shuddered and the pressure around my chest released. A great blue heron materialized on the step, huge, nearly five feet tall, her thick throat like a rope, her shoulders hunched, her legs two pale orange stalks with high ankles like contorted knees. She stared at me ferociously with a round yellow eye and then squawked, trembling, and collapsed into another creature, a pocket mouse. The mouse raced forward and sniffed anxiously at my slippered feet. Then it stretched accordion-like, squeaking and hissing, now a rattlesnake, firm and sleek in brown and ivory scales. Offhawker, my German grandmother would have said, shapeshifter. The snake rattled its tail, but I felt no fear. My visions made me impenetrable. Perhaps sensing my disinterest, the heron returned to her natural form. She preened for me, and I longed to show off my own powers. I ignored the creature and glanced around me instead, waiting for the stage curtain to draw open and reveal the future. The wind nodded in her dark shawl of glittering stars, crouched with her strong thighs all around us. A few yards away lay the disembodied head of a mule deer buck. His purple tongue hung from his mouth, the heavy antlers and neck mottled with blood. Killed by coyotes, no doubt, or perhaps by a lone mountain lion. When I turned, there was the heron grooming her feathers with the wetted orange spear of her beak. I hunkered on a precipice overlooking the Columbia. The water coursed indifferently toward the ocean, gripped in its basin by the rocky fist of cliffs on the eastern side. The heron's black plume stirred in the wind. I turned to her, waiting. Her beak remained closed, but she spoke to me as loud as a branch breaking. Watch the river. I watched. The water drained away so slowly at first, I wondered if I was imagining it. But then, yes, certainly, the water was leaving for good, as though the basin were no more than a long serpentine bathtub from which an invisible hand had pulled the plug. The shoulders of rocks appeared like dark scabs, thousands of them, and I fought the urge to run down the side of the basin and dance across them. The heron lifted her speckled throat and the long feathers on her neck jutted like thorns. Then she cowered and in a deft movement, lifted away from the hill's summit, beating her large wings ponderously, swooping toward the desolate river basin. I beetled down the hillside after her, Recalling how, when I was a girl, I would plunge down the bouldered embankment into the aching cold of the Okanagan River. On the rocky beach, the heron waited for me. She pointed her beak toward the belly of the riverbed. I ambled atop the black rock, skipping from one to another, but they shifted beneath my feet. I slipped again and again, trying to gain purchase and failing. I wasn't annoyed. It was a game, no more. A fun game to play atop the rocks. And when I tripped into the small puddles of water, all that remained of the Columbia, I laughed and splashed. I put my hand against a round stone and was surprised to find it wet, not with water, but with something soft and fleshy, algae, I assumed, moss. I drew the substance away like it were the, pop of a like it were the top of a mushroom, and it came off in my palm easily with a little pop. The smell was both terrible and good, a burning, like over-roasted meat. I turned the thing over in my hand and stared for a moment, disbelieving, before dropping it at my feet. It was the skin of a child's face. The black stone was no stone but a skull, grinning at me fiendishly. I examined the other stones, the ones I danced across so clumsily and merrily, and they too were skulls, and beneath them, trapped in the mud of the riverbed, were the bodies. People of all ages, small children, others stooped and old. A high-pitched whining started up in my left ear, the tinnitus I suffered during a vision or if I grew too exhausted. I found a woman with her breast blackened and burned, pockets of flesh half melted. Around her, some of the skull's mouths screamed, others were pinned tight, addressing their end calmly as though struck dumb by its arrival. Who are they? I cried. What's happened to them? The wind whipped at me, scolding me, and some of the skulls crumbled into dust beneath her words. When I turned, there was the heron, picking awkwardly at the bones with her nightmarish toes. She lifted her head and gazed at me with the gold death coin of her eye. 
eventually we must become who we are. Um, and I will stop there. Uh, thank you, everybody. Wow, that's incredible. Oh, I, you know, I just, I really enjoyed your book. And the reason, one reason I enjoyed it so much is because I grew up just 15 miles away from Hanford. So I know that landscape so well that as I read, uh, as I read your book, I could just see those characters in the landscape. And, uh, you know, thinking back on it, it's sometimes it's a little hard for me to distinguish fact from fiction in the two things. Uh, I mean, that's how compelling that uh, those passages were. You know, it's interesting because, um, oh, sorry. I right, just, go ahead, sorry. I'm just going to try to get my slides to work, but so yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, we, yeah. we can talk. Well, I was just going to say, I, I had to draw quite a lot, um, not just on the tour I took of Hanford back in 2015, but also um, just from all the time I spent in the OMAC Okanagan area growing up with my grandparents and my mom's family there. Um, so that whole sagebrush step was, and the smell yeah. of it and the intensity of it was um, something I, I drew on a lot, but yeah. All yeah, right, it's a, well, it's let a you know. place. But I think especially for people who grew up there, they know how they know what, how beautiful it is. Let's see if I can get these slides to work. Uh, that's to write this book. In other words, um, was a lot of your book suggested by the things that you read or was, was your strategy more to get a gist of the story so that you could then sort of convey the emotional impact of Hanford and what it produced in your novel? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, I would say a, a little bit of both of that. Um, I, I did not set out when I originally thought I would be writing a book. Um, I, I was thinking I would write a mad scientist novel set here in the Northwest, but based on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, and oh, really? I wasn't sure where to set that book, but I had some ideas, uh, very wild ideas. Like I was gonna have it be narrated by a brain in a jar. Um, this will not come as a surprise to anyone who's read my other work, my short story collection or the Sasquatch Hunter's Almanac. Um, my stuff tends to be very imaginative and very out there. Um, and elements of that are of course in this book as well. Um, but it was really, uh, someone had said to me, because I was diagnosed with MS, um, well, we have a high incidence of MS here because of, we're downwind of Hanford. Um, and I, uh, I didn't really know what to make of that information. Um, I had always heard about Hanford, um, but I, I didn't know a lot about it. And so then I booked a tour in 2015 to go and see the Hanford site because I thought, oh, well, this place that created nuclear weapons would be a perfect uh, mad scientist novel potentially. So uh, I, I booked that tour. I think it was right as uh, it had been created as a national monument. Um, so it was a very, it was very early on and when they had opened it up to the public and it took me months to get on the tour. It was so popular. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Popular. yeah. Um, but when I went there, I learned that, uh, the people working there um, did not know what they were making, which uh, really took me by surprise. And I learned about the idea of all the secrecy of it. Um, and that intrigued me as a novelist, um, that sort of uh, pressure on people to really keep a lockdown on what jobs they're doing, what, what their livelihood is, all of that. Um, and so I, I started thinking about, uh, oh, and I also, when I was on the tour, was really interested in, in some of the items I read about um, the women working at, at Hanford. And I started thinking about um, my mom and her family, uh, the 1940s, all of that. And all of a sudden I was uh, envisioning writing something I'd never written before, which is a historical novel. Um, and that really, uh, that really was kind of a new wheelhouse for me entirely. Um, I work in a library, or at the time I worked in a library, I love research, even my really wacky items I write are typically researched, um, like even the Sasquatch Hunters Almanac, I was researching cryptozoologists and the like. Um, so uh, I did a bit of a dive into Hanford research. Um, I, one book I checked out repeatedly was Atomic Frontier Days. 
Um, I uh, loved the Voices of the Manhattan Project, uh, which is an incredible website for people interested uh, at all in, in this. You can, you can hear from people who were um, janitors that were working uh, at these sites versus, you know, the major generals, like they've, they've interviewed a ton of different people. Um, and so those reading those interviews was really interesting to me. Um, and I think, you know, that's where I learned a lot about the barbed wire being put up around the women's barracks and some of the violence that was occurring there. Um, and all of that, uh, you know, the militancy, uh, the regions, uh, colonialism, uh, misogyny, all of that became very connected to me as I was working on the book. And then what we did overseas as well, uh, the violence of that act. Um, so I will, I will say though, I, I am not, uh, and this is probably why I'm a fiction writer, I am not uh, an, ex an extremely detail-oriented person. Um, so when I read a book like yours, um, I'm just so, uh, or like Atomic Frontier Days where there's been such careful research, I feel a, a vast um, canyon between, uh, you know, the details that you have and even understanding the science of it, um, which for me, uh, I certainly tried to make that attempt uh, and do not think it was successful necessarily, um, as opposed to me being on the other side of that canyon writing at, at it from a fictional, uh, imagine, uh, more imaginative place. Um, and for me, I, I think at the core of my fiction usually is a, uh, is a question. Um, and I, I'm always wondering potential for us to evolve into something less, less militaristic, less violent, less, um, uh, less cruel to one another on both interpersonal levels and on global levels. And that became the huge uh, push of the book for me. Um, but I, I will say, I feel like almost every page has something researched. Um, and, uh, but I don't know, you know, I, I, I might not have, you know, double checked that research with something else the way that you might do as a journalist. That's a when long time. <laughs> yeah, when, when you read the history, are you, does it give you more ideas for what you could have done with the book? Uh, I don't know, you know, I've never written fiction, so I don't know yes. if people think about their books that way. I certainly do, yes. you know, when I think about my nonfiction, I'll read about his, I'll go back to Hanford again, and I'll think, oh, darn, I could have gotten that paragraph so much better. No, I, I feel that way entirely. I mean, reading your book, and I think I emailed this to you, I felt like, oh, I wish I could go back and amplify amplify this chapter, or it made yeah. me think about uh, entire scenes I might tweak a little bit. Um, it made me kind of question some of the things I did, like blurring, um, you know, what what happened to certain uh, people who were harmed in, in Hiroshima versus Nagasaki. I kind of brought some of that research together, um, but, was so intrigued by what you had done by concentrating on the surgeon in, in Nagasaki. And I, I thought, oh, if only I'd read this before, I could have, you know, the surgeon might have made it into the book or something. So, yeah, I well, mean, I'm always editing myself in that way, even with things that are finished. But, um, but yeah, I would have devoured this. Yeah, for sure. Nonfiction so. is easy because there's only one, you know, there's only one story and you're trying to tell it, whereas fiction just seems like you have these infinite possibilities. So. <laughs> direction yeah. in which you go seems uh, seems hard yeah but well, whenever yeah. whenever fictional treatments of the manhattan project are undertaken i think people always grapple with this issue of how much how much to make up and how much to rely on the history yeah yeah and there were a few things you know that i i realized huh you know i think i whatever i i thought i had researched was maybe wrong in that instance i think we both we both talk about uh the wanapum the tribe there um right. and you had mentioned i think in your book that um, they were uh, they were stripped of fishing rights for a time, but it was after World War II, and I might have I might have confused that in the book um, and had the timing off. So it's it's interesting to um, realize those things and be like, oh, dang it, you know. But, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you know, the novel has an integrity just from its vision. I, you know, I think that's the difference between the fictional, fictional and a non-fictional approach to this. Right. It's the, yeah. it's the, yeah. the vision that really appeals to people. And so when I'm reading it and I see little things like that, 
I would just say that this is contributing to this broader vision, regardless of what really happened in history, because a lot of things in the novel didn't really happen that way. Yeah. It's uh, sort of your your depiction, almost an emotional depiction of yes. this of this non-fictional story. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see. I think there are there may be some questions here. Uh, ask us a, a question or suggest a topic. I just opened that up and uh, did not see a single one. So maybe well, we get maybe we get to keep talking. Yeah. But James, uh, James and Jessica may have one. I, I do have another historically related question. You know, one of the main characters in your book is a is a scientist named Dr. Hall. I assume that Dr. Hall was a composite of many different scientists, but uh, Yes. Again, I'm curious about the extent to which he was based on your historical reading about some of the scientists there. There, I mean, and Enrico Fermi is there, and Leona Woods is there on the tour. They must have shown you Leona Woods was the only female physicist there, and they actually you know created a separate bathroom for her. And you have that whole scene. That bathroom has been uh, blocked up now, so it no longer exists. But if you go on the tour, say where was Leona Woods' bathroom? Because they'll <laughs> show you the place in the wall where they put the cinder blocks in to to fill that door in. Yeah, that's he right. Just carved a portion out of the men's room and said, "This is Leona's bathroom." So, anyway, <laughs> I know, uh, all, all kinds of little historical tidbits like that do occur in your book. So, what about Dr. Hall? Dr. Hall was kind of an amalgamation. Um, I'm not I, now. I can't remember exactly who I was basing him off of. Yeah. Um, so I would have to go back and look, but a, a little bit of Fermi, I think. Uh, right. Although then I made Fermi kind of his own character because right. I think Dr. Hall, all of, I mean, and your book captures this really well. Not all of the scientists had the exact same mindset about how these weapons should be used. Not all of them felt the same moral response, I don't think, to the weapons. Um, and I love your discussion of that in here. Um, and I wanted those opin those varying opinions to be there. Um, you know, I think I think there were Oppenheimer and Fermi and those that ended up turning away from nuclear weapons production after uh, World War II happened versus someone like Leona Woods, who who was just like, we had no choice. We had to do this. Um, we did it for the betterment of of our country. And uh, she she was uh, absolutely firm on her stance um, that people, I mean, I think she even used the word crybabies in one interview, that people that worry about this, like I do, um, are a little bit of crybabies. And I, um, I was so interested in that. And she was so fascinating in general because, you know, she, she wanted to get out of Hanford. Um, and she, she, just, she just thought she was so bored, like babysitting this, uh, and I think you even mentioned the word babysitting as well in there, but babysitting the reactor, um, kind of sitting around while it's it's working, you know, just everybody's pressing the right buttons, everything's kind of moving along. Um, and all of that was really fascinating to me, those different opinions there. Um, and I also thought that you captured really well this sort of triangle that occurred between uh, the military mindset and the engineers and the scientists and the ways in which they, um, that tension that pulled uh, and pushed against one another throughout this whole um, creation of, of these weapons. But um, so, yeah. yeah. Engineers, as represented by the DuPont company that built and ran uh, Hanford during World War II and then other companies moved in uh, in, in succeeding years. Yeah. You know, it just it just occurred to me that your book, uh, I don't want to give anything away, but it does end right at the end of World War II. I wonder if you ever thought about, I mean, Hanford, you know, three reactors were built during the Manhattan Project, but then another six were built during the Cold War and really activity ramped up to the point that Hanford was a much busier and, and more productive in the terms of producing more plutonium in the 1960s and 1970s. But, uh, but I guess your book doesn't really nod toward the future of Hanford. It really concludes with uh, sort of the resolution of your main character's story. It does. I think, I think she has some visions about what will come with Hanford, uh, specifically talking about the green run, um, uh -huh. some of what Karen Dorn Steele um, reported here in The Spokesman, which were some of the most interesting articles to me. Um, she, there was an issue with um, uh, 
a lamb, like the lambs that were, were born. I think in, in my book, they're born in a, a bathroom. Um, it was later. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that, I, I that, that. Was, uh, that was also post Green Run um, when Karen Dorn Steele had reported that there were all these farmers. Um, and after there had been a release at Hanford, a lot of the uh, livestock was getting really sick, especially lambs in the area. Um, and several different farms were affected. And these lambs were born that were just basically balls of goo, um, you know, muscles and uh, malformed skulls and all of that. Um, so there are some things she sees that are um, that are in the future and not. And that was kind of uh, one of the like handy things of having a clairvoyant <laughs> character. But I learned I learned so much more about because I, I really did concentrate most of my research in that 1940s creation of Hanford era. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I, um, I don't know if I will revisit Hanford in, in another work, but, uh, I'm so still so interested in it and, and concerned by it too. Um, so yeah. That's right. I had forgotten about that. There actually is a foreshadowing of the cold war in the book. Um, you know, it's plutonium that basically serves as the trigger in all of the nuclear weapons that exist today, including the thousand or so that are the, at the submarine base is 20 miles away from uh, here from here in Seattle. Uh, it, essentially it's a small Nagasaki bomb that is used to set off the larger nuclear explosion of the hydrogen bomb that's, uh, uh, that, that produces much more energy. In fact, you know, that's why my book is called The Apocalypse Factory. It's really about the fact that if the plutonium of Hanford were ever used, that would be the end of the world. Uh, it's not so much a reference to the site itself as it is to, um, so how that plutonium continues to threaten us today, that plutonium that was generated at Hanford. Yeah. James is back. Uh, yeah, I am. Hello. That was, it was great to, I, I love the combination of, of, of the factual and the, and the fictional and, and hearing you guys bounce back and forth, how those things uh, work together. Um, picking up on something you said there, that um, the, the legacy of Hanford and the fact that your title kind of refers to not just the Nagasaki bomb, but but what's come after it. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, back in a previous century, uh, I, the consensus seemed to be uh, that the dropping of the bombs was almost a humanitarian act, right? A way of resolving the war quickly, more quickly than it would have been, uh, and, and saving lives over what would have happened with a, with a prolonged war. And that, that certainly doesn't seem to be the case today. Could either of you speak to uh, how that perception has shifted and, and what the current consensus might be about, I mean, because I know I've heard people say everything from what I just described, that it was that it was beneficial uh, to that it was a horrific war crime. And uh, is, there, is there a historical consensus now as to how we view that? I, I do address that history a little bit and Sharma, I'll let you chip in here. But, um, you know, even in the very week after the Nagasaki bombing, people were already starting to argue this issue. And they've been arguing this issue for 75 years about whether those bombs were necessary to end the war. And what was more important, was it the Hiroshima bomb? Was it the combination of the two bombs? Was it uh, the Soviet Union's invasion of uh, China uh, on August 8th, two days after the Hiroshima bomb was dropped? There were so many, it's, it's such an interesting, Histor I mean, entire books have been written about this, uh, really dozens of books, and continue to be written. Uh, this, this controversy is still alive today over the exact things that led to the end of World War II. All I could really do in my book was say that there were lots of things going on at that time. And the, the narrative that, ha that was sort of constructed a couple years after the war, that it was a stark choice between dropping the atomic bombs and invading the mainland of Japan, was not really the way that people looked at it at the end of World War II. It was quite a bit more complex and fluid situation. Uh, when I worked in Washington, D.C., I was sometimes involved in the construction of those narratives. And so I, some, I, I kind of know what policymakers, including Tr President Truman, were trying to do in 1948 to justify past actions. But it's a fascinating historical episode. Wow, I, I could have spent months and months just reading the literature on on that particular topic. Jeremy, did you did you deal with it at all, or do you ever think about those those things? Boy, I I, I try to stay out of the middle of those arguments since they're uh, they're uh, no. 
I mean, it, it's something, yeah, it's something I, I I read about a bit, um, and uh, I thought you you talked about it well too in your book. I, um, from from what some of the things I read were really suggesting that um, this this really was um, a sort of marvel that we were pushing. I mean, originally it was meant for Germany. It was supposed to be because Germany was possibly creating similar weapons and we needed to defeat that race. But as, as Steve's uh, book points out, um, there were, uh, uh, how much was it? Like two, $3 billion poured into uh, the expense of creating these weapons. And one of the um, generals says, I think it's the general that says, um, there's no way they're not gonna let us drop this expensive of a war machine. Uh, there's no way that they're gonna let us just can it back up and not use it. Um, and I think when I kept looking at the timeline of all of this, and when I was reading about how Japan was really quarantined on their island by that point, um, and had already been, their power kind of starting to snuff out, uh, even their food supply starting to maybe be snuffed out, um, I mean, for me, it's almost how can anybody debate that it was absolutely necessary? And a lot of people will talk about the um, how uh, Japan refused to surrender in one of the last, and I, I'm momentarily blanking on the name of it, uh, Steve, one of the last meetings the countries had together. Um, and they... Uh, they, they didn't want to unconditionally surrender, but they were open to talking about surrender. Um, and that's something I, I think sometimes doesn't get picked up in the literature. And the thing that I kept thinking about while I was writing is, um, it is true, Japan did horrible things too in this war to various countries, uh, just as we did horrible things to them. Um, just as you can look at almost any major power and see how they've harmed people, um, whether it's their own people, which I think we can talk about very easily with our own country or another country's people or both. Um, but ultimately, we dropped bombs on cities that are very similar to the cities where we live and it harmed people who were children, um, innocent people. Uh, and that to me, and it wasn't just, um, you know, a uh, 1,000, 2,000 people. This was hundreds of thousands of people. And um, it's, it's astonishing to me uh, that we could do that. Um, and I, I wanted there to be in the novel this idea of, I think I wrote down when I was reading uh, The Apocalypse Factory, I wrote down, the marvel versus the moral issue at hand uh, was one of my notes that I said, because it was a marvel of science, what we were able to create at Hanford. Um, and it's, and Steve documents it so well, it's, it is almost miraculous that we were able to create this level of science to this degree and, and do it so quickly and, and bring together this entire workforce. Um, but what it, what it, reaped was, um, to me, a major atrocity, a major war crime, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so that's my soapbox. <laughs> and, and you know how that plays, one, one of the places that plays out is in how these issues are depicted at the B Reactor and as part of the Manhattan District National Historical Park. Which parts of these stories do you emphasize? How do you tell all the story? The story is so big and complicated that it's gonna be hard for a single display in a visitor center that hopefully will someday be built at the B Reactor to try to explain some of these things. But I really think, I make the case in the book as have other people that it's a real opportunity to try to teach people about not only the technological marvel, but about the moral issues that were involved in building and using the bomb. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It seems and to me that um, the, well, you mentioned the, the two other locations that are connected with this. It seems to me, uh, maybe this is just, you know, Western bias that, that Hanford hasn't gotten the historical due uh, that those other places have. Uh, you know, Los Alamos, I feel like for most people is considered the birthplace of the atomic bomb. Um, but as you point out in the book that, you know, uh, Hanford was 
more significant, or at least as significant at the time, and more significant in the following years. Um, but like I said, maybe that's just being from Washington and wanting to puff up our chests a little bit in a strange way. And that doesn't even touch on the issue of the historical impact of the uh, of the of the waste of the environmental situation that we continue to deal with there, um, which uh, could be the subject for a whole other book for either of you. Really. Yeah. Yeah. One of um, I did a I did a event with Kathleen Flitikin, who's here right now, and I had mentioned in the comments that her book Plume is wonderful, and both uh, uh, Steve has an amazing section talking about Kathleen and and. Um, both of our books have epigraphs of her poetry there. Um, but uh, when we finished that um, discussion, uh, uh, one of my friends from grade school, who I haven't seen since grade school, approached, and she is now working with the Nez Perce tribe on the cleanup at Hanford. And she talked about, uh, you know, some of the elements that they're working on there to try to clean up uh, have... Uh, a half-life of 15,000 years or something like there. And these are dangerous materials, she was saying. Um, so it was really interesting to hear her perspective too on that. But, yeah. yeah, I make the case in the book, James, that the Hanford site is really the most important site in the whole Manhattan Project. Things that happened there that uh, the, both the science and the technological developments that happened in Hanford were just absolutely critical. I mean, that B-reactor, the first large scale nuclear reactor built anywhere in the world and every reactor in the world today is basically a descendant of the B reactor and uses technologies that were developed there and even terminology that people used and, and uh, originated at the B reactor to talk about this uh, facility that they were building. And, and, and you know, there's another way to maybe measure that important. Sharma, could you ever think about writing a novel like this about Oak Ridge or Los Alamos? I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, could you write the sort of mad scientist book that you started out with? It's possible. <laughs> But I think Hanford is by far the best site to write a book like this. You you could probably yeah. do it, but I wouldn't I wouldn't want to try it. And are there other are there books like this that have been written about Los Alamos and or Oak Ridge? I, I think not. But your book is you know very unique in that regard. Um, there there was a book that came out just about a year before mine, and I was like, uh oh, this is really similar to my book. Uh, except hers was very much historical realism, um, but it was about. Um, uh, or I think it's called the Atomic Girls. Does that sound right? Does anybody know right. what I'm talking about? Atomic Girls, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it set, yeah, it was set at one of those. Um, but also started just like Mildred's with a woman leaving her home True. to, you know, going to work at a nuclear facility. And that was really, uh, yeah, fascinating to me. For me personally, I have ended up being such a regional writer uh, by accident or not, uh, it would it would be difficult for me to go there and and write about those things viscerally um, in any way. But um, I wanted to ask you, Steve, and I don't know how much more time we have or not. But can you talk? Can you tell people about your title, The Apocalypse Factory? Because I I found uh, uh, a section in the book was really interesting when you talk about the word apocalypse and its meaning. Um, and you talk a little bit about about that. I thought um, that might be kind of cool for listeners too. Yeah, I was a little concerned about that title, The Apocalypse Factory, because I didn't want people to think I was referring to the site itself, as I mentioned earlier, to the environmental contamination or even to the health effects. And that's that's an easy interpretation to take of this title. I mean, I really wanted to talk about how plutonium is being used today. But, you know, I also, think about how what the word apocalypse really means. In the Bible, uh, apocalypse is really a revelation, a, a revelation that meant, that's meant to provide hope uh, in a time of uncertainty. And I talk about this in the context of the museum, actually, that, as I mentioned just a minute ago, that we have this opportunity to learn from the history of Hanford. One, one option, I mean, there's not much to see in Oak Ridge or Los Alamos. You can go there and they'll say, well, you can imagine these gigantic buildings that that we use to, to make uranium-235, but those buildings are all gone. But at Hanford, we have this very first nuclear reactor that was ever built, and it should be preserved. And as many people as possible should go and see it, because it does serve as a warning. The history of Hanford really is a warning 
about how these scientific and technological developments can endanger all of us, really. I mean, you know, the, those nuclear weapons could end human civilization. And, uh, and, and so, but, but that, that's Armageddon, really. Uh, the apocalypse is the warning of Armageddon uh, that uh, is issued. And so I, I talk about that both in the final pages of the book and then besides Kathleen's uh, beautiful poems, uh, one of which starts the book, I also mention uh, the, the way in which I'd like people to think about the word apocalypse. Uh, yeah, and, oh, go ahead, sorry, Sharma. No, I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to mention, um, Steve talks about this and, and I, had, I had researched some things like this, I think in like Popular Science Magazine talking about the enormous magnitude of the weapons now that they are so many times stronger. And I can't, I, I think it's 50 times stronger. Is that right, Steve? Right. It's mm -hmm. um, like, and it will, it will throw us into a nuclear winter and absolutely destroy food supply and everything um, if, you know, people start dropping these, um, as, as well as just destroying so much human life and causing so much pain and suffering the way that it, that it has. Um, anyway. Yeah. Even a small war, even a small war, the exchange of 100 weapons between India and, and Pakistan is likely to so reduce global temperatures that there would be widespread famine with billions of people dying from lack of food. So, uh, and that's just a few hundred weapons compared to the 1500 that we have aimed at the Soviet Union and, and other enemies and that the Soviet Union has aimed at us. Uh, I'll throw a few questions at you guys here from the chat, uh, one of which says, uh, goes to both of you. Uh, in your, doing your research, was there something that you learned that really stood out as, as shocking you or something unexpected? Oh, for my research, you know, one thing that was amazing is how many things had to come together and happen at the same time. If you ran history again, I doubt very much that plutonium would have been discovered just exactly at the right time to get the Manhattan Project started. I don't think the Manhattan Project would have started if uh, this obscure scientist at the University of California, Berkeley hadn't discovered plutonium in 1941, it was gonna to be too hard to make a bomb the other way. Uh, when we had two ways to do it, the Manhattan Project uh, occurred. When, it's something Sharma said, when you go there and see how many things had to go right for those yeah. bombs to work and for them to be able to drop them on those Japanese cities. I have this uh, chapter in my book, which is about the Nagasaki bombing mission. Almost everything went perfect on the Hiroshima mission, but the Nagasaki bombing mission was plagued by problems from the very beginning. The fact that that mission was successful is just astonishing because it could have failed half a dozen times before they ever got to Nagasaki, which wasn't even the primary target. The, the Nagasaki was the backup target and the primary target was covered by clouds. So there's just all these amazing historical coincidences and contingencies. I, I just had no idea. You look back on it, it all seems preordained as if it was going to happen. But there are all these human moments that could have gone in a completely different direction. How about you, Sharma? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the swiftness with which with or with which all of this came together. I remember reading early on that you know they were basically taking a very small model. I mean, I almost pictured like a shoebox size model that that Fermi had created in Chicago and then blowing it up in Hanford and creating this working nuclear reactor based on that. Um, the fact that it went as smoothly as it did is, is um, was astonishing to read about. Uh, and uh, But for me, I think the thing that really ended up driving my book uh, was learning about uh, all of the years of secrecy with it um, and all of the years, uh, secret, secrets that were there until the 80s before they finally started declassifying information. Um, and also um, uh, the patriotism people had to say, okay, I don't need to know what I'm creating. I'm here for the war effort. I'm here to do this. Um, and um, wondering you know uh what that would look like now if anything like that could happen um not saying that it's even necessarily a good thing that sort of mob mentality um but uh it was just all of those things together were what really made me want to create a character who uh who was a seer and could see through that secrecy and start figuring out what it was they were doing, what the end goal was gonna be. Um, 
and that's when you know the whole idea of the Cassandra myth came to me, and Mildred was created from that. But. That actually segues right into another question that was posed here about uh, how you came up with the idea to use Greek myth as your frame. Uh, what was the inspiration behind that? How does it function in the book? Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> that was uh, that 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 was that idea of secrecy. That idea of um, uh, someone being able to penetrate that more easily, uh, and also someone not being believed. Uh, it being a woman it being during a time of war, similar to Cassandra, um, you know, in the Aeschylus play with um, the Trojan War. Um, all of those things became really interesting to me, as well as, I mean, there's a lot of historical research in the book. There's also a lot of personal uh, issues too, from my family life, from, from my own experiences, um, some of them uh, uh, very upsetting. <laughs> Uh, as a youth. And so I, there was quite a lot I was pulling from and pulling together um, when I was thinking about the Greek myth of Cassandra. Um, she is a woman who was raped in the book, uh, or in the play. Uh, she's taken as a concubine by Agamemnon. Uh, she foresees her own end. She foresees the violence of it. Um, but it, she's cursed to never be believed. And that that's how I fashioned my entire character. I think the first thing that happened was that tour of Hanford. And the next thing was thinking about that myth. And from that was born the character that I wrote about. Um, so it's kind of, and as far as like Greek myths, I, I think my mind always goes there because that's what I loved reading as a girl. All of my books have Greek mythology in them. Um, I, I think I'm naturally, I start making parallels to <laughs> the mythological fairy tales I loved as a kid. Hans Christian Andersen, you'll see a lot of those tropes kind of coming up in my work. Um, okay. um, a couple more here. Uh, this one, uh, mostly to Steve. I know, I, I think you touched on this a bit, but this asks about addressing the uh, research done on the downstream residents, uh, subsequent clusters of illnesses as a result of that nuclear work. Um, how is that covered in your book? And what more can we say about that? Yeah, this is an, an interesting issue. It's another one about which a whole book could be written. I am a downwinder. Uh, I grew up, uh, you know, just 15 miles downwind from the reactors. Uh, I know lots of people in my town and I know lots of people uh, in the area surrounding Hanford who've had uh, serious health problems and, uh, have reason to believe that those health problems may, uh, may be caused by radiation. And I have no doubt that radiation released from Hanford has caused health problems uh, among, among people I know and among people that lived in the surrounding areas and among people who, who worked at Hanford. And, and you have to take that, that lived experience into account in, in trying to decide uh, what the health effects are. There's a second side to this issue. I, I'm a science writer scientists have studied this issue extensively. They've done very careful peer-reviewed research of uh, health effects and have looked for health effects in the Tri-Cities area and among downwinders. And they have not been able to find in, in, in many of the, the biggest and, and theoretically best studies that have been done, large health effects among the people that live around Hanford. And so I report that in the book. I mean, that's the second kind of evidence that you have to take into account in thinking about this issue. People have no doubt been harmed, but for instance, am I excessively worried about the exposures that I got as a kid? Or do I worry about going to the Tri-Cities today? I don't, because the conclusion I draw from the epidemiological studies is that the risk, while it exists and undoubtedly affected individuals, is not so great as other risks that we encounter in our everyday lives. Now, everybody you know, makes different decisions about risk. And there are people I know who wouldn't go near the Tri-Cities uh, on, a, on a dare. Uh, but I, I don't think of it that way. I, I take these two bodies of evidence and try to, try to weigh the two together. Um, there's lots of people who will argue with those points of view or with the, with the either of those two sides of the evidence, one way or the other. Uh, I, I try to present all the facts in the book as I do on other issues and, and try to let people sort of come to their own conclusions rather than telling them what they should think. 
Uh, there's one more here that I will, uh, uh, it's a fairly specific thing. Uh, was Hanford established solely for the purpose of developing the weapon uh, or was it a general research facility? Hmm, nope, just uh, just for weapon. It was entirely weapon oriented. I mean, in that respect, Sharma has it exactly right. In that uh, um, they knew at the, from the very beginning that they were building a nuclear weapon. And there were scientists who from the very beginning, including the scientists who conceived of the very idea of nuclear fission way back in the early 1930s, who was, and who was the one who got, who helped get the Manhattan Project started. He also fought in a, in a very serious way toward the end of World War II to use the bomb in some other way than dropping it on a Japanese city. He was the one arguing for a demonstration project. But he was a voice in the wilderness. He was like Mildred in Sharma's novel. Uh, people, uh, he, he could not get that point of view across given the prevailing sentiments about how the bomb should be used. And, and, and that's one of the interesting things I think about the Xander is that um, you realize that in retrospect, the vast majority of people can be missing something. And that's why, that's why people who can see the future are so interesting because they show us the mistakes we're making in the present, even though everyone is convinced that that's the right thing to do. Well put. Uh, well, I'll take a moment here to uh, remind you again, that there's still time to, to click on that button about buying these books, uh, which are, are both fantastic. And I love how complimentary they are. I think it'd be a wonderful kind of book club uh, event to have people cover cover both of these books with their different angles. Uh, there's so much to talk about. I wish we had more time to, to go into it here. Um, I should mention before I let everybody get out of here that of course we're doing this every Thursday. Uh, and next week we're gonna have a, another Northwest legend of sorts with us, Larry Watson. Um, and that's gonna be a great event. Uh, starting in August, we're gonna be moving from the Crowdcast platform to Zoom, um, which seems to be a little more robust. Um, and uh, not that we've had any technical issues tonight, thankfully, um, but this will keep us from having them. Um, with the Hanford uh, bomb production have been so smooth. Um, uh, at any rate, so like I said, buy those books, tune in again for the events, and uh, join me in thanking both Sharma Shields and Steve Olson for this great conversation. I, I, I'm so glad you got to be with us tonight, and uh, I, I so much want to recommend these books to people. So thanks for being here. Thank you, James. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Sharma. Hey, thanks so much. That was so fun. Thank you. It was. Right. We'll see you guys next time. OK.